Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Nick Stern. My duty is to uh, welcome you all and then sit somewhere where I'm not noticed and listen to this splendid event. This is the launch of the uh, LSE Growth Commission Mark II, and we're enormously grateful to people on the platform who I'll introduce in just a moment for launching this in such a strong uh, way. The Growth Commission reported in January 2013, and it was uh, chaired by Tim Besley and John Van Rienen. The revision, the Mark II, will be chaired by, um, again, Tim Besley and with Steve Machin and myself. Last time round, we looked at what might drive growth forward in the future, and we spoke about infrastructure, skills, and innovation. We worried about income distribution, but in a rather simple way, we said there should be more focus on median income as opposed to average income. I'm not trying to rehearse the whole thing because we want to listen to our uh, guests. This time round, well, some of you will have noticed the world has changed quite a lot in the last uh, four years. The stagnation has been longer than we thought. The euro crisis <coughs> has been a big problem. China's rate of growth is changing, and its nature of its growth is changing in fundamental ways, moving much more to service sector, high tech, and uh, so on, and along with uh, other parts of the emerging market. Um, inequality has moved much closer to center stage in a deeper way than uh, simply uh, median income. And uh, many of you will notice there was a vote on June 23rd uh, to uh, leave the European Union. So a lot's changed in four years, but it's not just the Brexit story. This time round, we'll be focusing, of course, on the issues, infrastructure, skills, innovation that we did before, but we'll be focusing on issues which have been opened up uh, in large measure by the Brexit vote, because we didn't say much about trade, because that was an EU story last time. Clearly, trade will be a big part. The finance uh, sector will be a big part, and its role particularly its role in the future of a new picture of growth and a new relationship with the world that we have to discover. Industrial strategy is on the agenda. Now, there are many things that could be. We tend to take rather a horizontal view of what's important, competition, <laughs> infrastructure, and finance, and so But that's not the only perspective on infrastructure, as we'll hear. And finally, labor markets and, uh, and skills. So those four areas where we'll be focusing, of course, totally consistent with where we focused last time, but other things have intervened and uh, opened up. So the event uh, is going to stop at 7.30, so better start pretty quickly. Um, we have uh, a wonderful group. Um, Stephanie Flanders will be organizing the conversation. She's been at the uh, US Treasury, the BBC, and is now with JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, Vince Cable, this is alphabetical order. Vince uh, Cable uh, was chief economist. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry? F doesn't come before C. <laughs> but you, you are. <laughs> this is a university, we've had categories. There's, you are the interviewer, and there's only one of you, right? Okay. We better stop this. The, um, so, um, Vince, uh, Chief Economist of Shell, Secretary of State, Business, Investment and Skills, and he's now here at the LSE as a Professor of uh, Practice. Um, we have <clears throat> Alistair Darling, who was formerly the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, MP, was MP for Edinburgh South West, and he's now since um, almost a year <clears throat> in the House of Lords. And uh, we have George Osborne, another former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Many things, again, we could say about all of them. George is MP uh, for uh, Tatton in Cheshire. Totten in Cheshire. Tatton. Tatton in Cheshire. For the moment. The famous Tatton. <laughs> While the seat exists. <laughs> Very good. That's enough for me. Um, we're enormously privileged to have this group here. I wanted to pay tribute to Richard Davis, who, as they say in India, or I've worked much of my life. He's been the life force behind this event. So Richard, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go and sit down and enjoy myself. Over to you. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Nick. 
Um, we do have these, these three big political beasts, and if I was in my old job, I'd think of some joke around the collective noun for three large political beasts. I won't, I'll just say we have a hat trick of senior politicians who've all been distinguished themselves by thinking about growth uh, in at different times, uh, but at senior levels in, in government. I might also say a little bit about uh, the context for this and why I think it probably is useful to look at that um, previous commission from the LSE and uh, think about what would need to be added to that view of growth, particularly in the light of uh, the, June, the June vote. You know, there is a view that the result was a rejection of a certain model of, of economic growth and policy making. Um, I'm not sure that's true, I think, and we obviously shouldn't get bogged down in what was and was not behind uh, the vote. I think what is really, has, I think the two things that are quite striking that I think are true and have come out of this uh, vote or been shown by uh, the vote, one is that suspicion of, of experts and that it's no long, it's sort of okay now to badmouth experts in a way it wasn't when this, the first LSE Growth Commission came out. <coughs> And I think the other one, which is perhaps even more surprising and different from the times when um, George and others were, were in power, is that um, politicians are now unabashed and unembarrassed about putting other things before the economy and are willing to say we will do things even if it costs the economy without much um, apology. Now, I don't know, that may be just a short-term effect of the extraordinary climate we have post uh, the vote. But I do think it's a sort of interesting fact that, in all, in, certainly in my lifetime, the fact that something was going to be quite damaging to the economy was a pretty strong reason why you didn't propose it or you tried to say, no, it's not damaging. I think there's been a willingness to say, no, actually, we're going to do this even though it is damaging. And it's maybe the commission could be an opportunity for the technocrats to fight back um, but also show that they're sensitive to some of the concerns that went into Brexit and have indeed been shown in concerns around globalisation and a, a certain kind of model of growth, which we see in the US election and across Europe, and we've talked about that at lots of previous events. Um, so there's plenty to discuss. I think there's uh, four particular areas um, that Nick touched on briefly that... Uh, LSE feel have would need to be now we need to think about what um, we have to add on that and what a, what the LSE commission could have to say on that that's the openness and trade finance, industrial policy and competition and labour markets and inclusive growth but I guess I'll, I'll start with you George but then go to, to the others too just to say you know, what do you think particularly given the last six months or so, should be on the agenda for this commission? And where could they add most value, if you think of it as being the sort of, you know, the technocrats fight back? Well, well first of all, um, thank you for having me here. And one of the reasons I came uh, was because the first piece of work that the LSE did in this space a few years ago had as one of its central recommendations a national infrastructure commission which, as Chancellor Exchequer, I then adopted directly from the LSE's idea and is now part of the law of the land and I think will improve decision-making on the roads and the railways and, and the like that you are all going to be using in the years ahead. And so, in other words, this is not, I hope, an exercise in vain. It will have a practical impact on policy-making for this government and future governments. And, uh, and so I wanted to support that, that exercise. Um, I mean, the, the truth is this, that although there are lots of things that um, I think you could get your teeth into as a commission, and I hope you do, like planning, which remains a huge obstacle, in my view, to growth in this country, uh, like the very interesting challenge of labor market regulation as uh, you get a, you know, a sharing economy and Uber drivers and the like, a really interesting subject, how do you maintain full employment whilst providing people with the employment rights that a mature democracy expects. So there are lots of interesting topics, and I wouldn't ask you to shy away from those. The truth is they will all have a marginal impact on 
growth and productivity over the coming years compared to the central decisions which are going to be taken in terms of our trading relationship with the European Union. So don't miss the elephant in the room. Uh, and uh, that, you know, whilst, as I say, a good planning law would be a great thing, uh, it's not going to, uh, in the end, trump uh, the decisions that are going to be taken about our relationship with our main export markets. And uh, you know, those will play out. And you're quite right to say, uh, and I don't think we should, I know it may be a surprising thing to say at the London School of Economics, but you know, politics is not always about economics. And I think if you look at the Brexit vote without going into it in, in great detail, because we could spend all night on, on that subject, you know, people were not voting because they thought they were going to be economically better off. When the, the surveys that have been done about why people voted to leave the EU was not because they thought their economy would be stronger. Uh, I think the data I've seen, only 6% of Brexit voters thought they would be economically better off. It was, I, in my view, about identity and about control, to use the mm. slogan of the Leave campaign. And uh, so I don't think we should be surprised in a democracy that it's not always about the economics. Thanks. And I think that's, but I think it's also perhaps a change in the way that we've, uh, across the West possibly, we're starting to not just put growth before um, issues well, like Arguably, identity. it's also, you know, it depends on the, you know, economic considerations are at their highest when you have high unemployment or a you know financial crisis as Alistair had to deal with you know those you know those are you know inevitably there's there's yeah. that factor as well but Alistair I mean you have there's those sort of four broad headings but lots of things we could talk about you know where uh, there's a relatively short uh, process involved with this commission where would you say if you were Chancellor now um, taking into account what, what George said where would where would you see the most potential I'll answer that, but, by, but as I'm an ex-politician, let me just make a preliminary comment about your expert's point. For goodness sake, we mustn't get bogged down on, on the idea of experts fighting back. This all stems from a particularly stupid remark made by Michael Gove during the referendum campaign <laughs> when he said he didn't like, we've had enough of experts. What he meant was, we've had enough with, of experts that disagreed with him. And I think you know, that says all you need to know about it, and we should just forget about him, as evidently the new Prime Minister has. Uh, we should <laughs> <laughs> on, Stephanie, your, your substantial point. Um, I was interested in uh, uh, what, you know, what was said earlier by next term about how the Commission had looked at growth uh, and, but not so much the impact on you know, the sort of growth on, on employment. And one of the most striking uh, reports that uh, I've seen this summer from experts uh, was a thing from the Resolution Foundation uh, which noted uh, that for the first time the millennial generation, as it is called, is now earning less than the predecessor generation. Now that has enormous repercussions, not just for the men and women who are affected by that, but of course it also has repercussions for the general contract we have in this country that you know, people work to support the older population as well as supporting people who are being educated. If they are not earning enough to look after themselves and to save, and that feeds through as they rise through and grow older, that will have very profound implications. And equally, you know, when you look at the, the, what's happening in the economy, every day people are talking about Uber and you know, all these, uh, these, these new, new developments. What does that actually mean in terms of the wealth or the earnings that are available to the people who are working there? And as we talk about, for example, driverless cars, um, that's fine, but it means the Uber drivers are already on their way out before they're, they're hardly there. So I think, I think the quality of growth and what it means in terms of um, the quality of employment uh, I think is, is absolutely important, which brings me to the last point that I want to make, which you, you raised and George has touched upon. I agree we're not going to spend the evening having an analysis of uh, why we voted the way we did in June. But I just note this, that I think, from my own observations during that campaign, if you go outside um, certainly the English cities, because in Scotland the politics are different, if you go out to the English cities, there is now a second and third generation who are very clear in their minds that they've lost out. And it isn't just a British phenomenon or English phenomenon, it's in the whole of Europe, it's in America. That's why Trump is doing so well, because he is harvesting this feeling of this grievance. And you know, if we don't attend to that,
and we don't make sure that growth uh, means that everybody benefits from it, not just a few, uh, then you know, many of the certainties that we've all proceeded on for most of our lives are uh, going to change. And so I think that's, it's the quality of growth that I would want this Commission to look at. I mean, I agree on the infrastructure, and that's absolutely great. Um, I used to listen to George Osborne announcing all sorts of road schemes, and I used to reflect that exactly the same ones as I announced 13 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Which just, which, just, which just goes to show that you shouldn't be surprised uh, that we've now got the go-ahead for the third runway at Heathrow, uh, and it's only 70 years since it was first proposed. <laughs> yes, I, I'd start with uh, George's elephant in the room. Um, I mean, in a way, there's not a great deal that government can do through conventional economic policy to offset the big consequences of the elephant, which is that there's radical uncertainty and businesses will not invest until they get greater clarity. Uh, I mean, the one thing, of course, government can do is invest itself. And I think there is a big issue which ran throughout your period, Alistair and, and George, about ha how we use public investment properly and get decent projects which are not politicized, which are high quality, produce high social returns, uh, and ensure that you know, the government does borrow to invest when there are good things to do. Uh, in terms of the Growth Commission, um, I don't know whether it was osmosis or direct influence, but many of the things which the Growth Commission talked about undoubtedly fed through into government thinking about long-term growth. I mean, as, as I recall it, um, the top of the list were policies to stimulate innovation. I mean, you'd expect that from the theory anyway, but you know, innovation has been a particularly British failure. Uh, and you know, successive governments have started to take this very seriously. I mean, there was stuff George did on tax policy. Uh, we introduced the catapult network and various concrete interventions to deal with that problem. I think the, the second on the list, as I remember, was training and skills, and we've been banging on about this through successive generations, let alone governments, but there has been, I think, a big decisive move to try and make advances through organised apprenticeships supported by proper funding arrangements. And I think the third in the list was uh, finance for business, and the particular market failures in the area of small, medium-sized growth companies. And again, a long-standing problem, but made absolutely acute by the financial crisis. Um, and as a consequence of that, various interventions have now happened. The, the British Business Bank was one. George obligingly signed a check for that. Uh, and you know, other, other attempts to deal with a very specific failure that was identified as a result of good economic analysis. It strikes me, I mean, one of the things that Brexit has done, and Nick mentioned this, that certainly it's thrown a lot of things up in the air and maybe opened uh, avenues that weren't open before for doing the right thing, even if it's for the wrong reason. And I sort of, you hear this in some of the conversations, particularly around skills, but also potentially around infrastructure. We don't know what the, mm -hmm. what the shift in policy might be in a few weeks' time from the Chancellor in favour of more um, public investment. But, you know, I wonder whether, uh, George, you want to comment that some of these issues that people have been banging on about for a long time, like skills, for example, we are now at a position where people are saying, well, we must invest in skills because we're not going to allow these immigrants in, therefore we're going to do the skills. Now, we may not be in favour of the second bit of that sentence, but is, is there scope here for making making good policy out of a decision that we didn't, wouldn't necessarily endorse, that there could be some good policy changes that come out of it? Well, I think up for grabs is the kind of new relationship we want, uh, not just with Europe, but with the world, and uh, the kind of um, economy we want to operate. And I think, you know, broadly speaking, you know, we should, and I would champion free markets, free trade, open societies, liberal democracies, but you know, that's, that they need defending not just in this country, but ar around the world. When it comes to skills, I, I mean, to be, to be absolutely frank, I think skills, there's definitely a, a big challenge and problem in the British economy with skills and has been for um, many decades. And I think uh, the school reforms that started actually under the Tony Blair government with academies and were accelerated 
by Michael Gove uh, under, uh, and under the coalition government and the work on apprenticeships you know, is all helping. But, uh, but remember, we are actually uh, close to full employment in this country. So I think the sort of argument that somehow you know, um, the, the immigrants are taking jobs that are leaving a load of people unemployed in Britain is not really, doesn't really stack up because there aren't a load of people unemployed in Britain. Uh, there are, I'm not saying that you know, the quality of the work to come on, to Alistair's point, is not as good as it could be for people, that you couldn't improve the skills of people. But the hard data is that the employment rate is one of the highest in the world. The unemployment role is the lowest it's been since 1971. So I don't really buy the argument that you know, there's a big pool of British people who, aren't, who don't have jobs, um, who need jobs. Uh, I'm all for trying to improve the quality of people's jobs. And actually, the most recent data showed that the incomes of the poorest 5% were rising at 6% a year, which is, uh, you know, a, 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 I would say, an achievement. Um, so I'm not sure I, you know, necessarily take that lead. The question then about trade and the like, again, that's up for grabs. <clears throat> you know, we shouldn't, I'm all for Britain being a free trading nation, but we shouldn't assume that, you know, post-Brexit, that's just accepted. I mean, first of all, there is our trading relationship with the place where 44% of our exports go, and you can't really claim to be a free trading nation if the first thing you do is erect a load of trade tariffs uh, to that market. And I'm all for doing trade deals with the rest of the world. Um, but again, I don't see at the moment that that's a universally accepted consensus in our country. Indeed, in our country and in many other Western countries, uh, trade policy is under scrutiny and people have questions about free trade. So I think this, you know, if you think of um, Brexit as an alliance between people who saw it as an opportunity for more free trade, less regulation, lower taxes, and other people who said, we want to retreat from those sorts of policies and retreat from globalization. Look, as a, as a conservative member of parliament, I'm, I'm siding with the former, but I'm not expecting that to be a you know, a, 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 the, the, to be uncontested. I think that's going to be a, a real contest in our country. Mm. Industrial policy is another area, maybe particularly, that we've heard more about in the last few months. And I think it's consistent with some things that were developed um, in your time, George. But I think there's certainly a feeling that there's more energy around the concept of industrial policy um, for better or, or, or good in the Brexit context. I don't know whether, I mean, Vince, what do you think industrial policy in this day and age should look like if we think that, you know, Philip Hammond is supposedly out there looking for one? Well, we, we had an industrial strategy, as we called it, in the coalition. Indeed, we picked up some pieces from Peter Mandelson before that. Um, so this was, isn't new. I'm just amazed when I hear government ministers reinventing the wheel. I mean, we've been over this, and there's a lot of... You were of, reinventing the wheel then. Well, we may... Well, no, I think we like to think we give some credit for our predecessors. But anyway, whoever, whether, whether we did or not. Um, I mean, I was a late convert to this. I mean, I'd been in government in the, in the, the old Department of Trade as an advisor, actually, in the 70s, and you saw all the horrors of 1970s-style industrial policy, which was taking the weakest <coughs> firms in the weakest industries and giving them subsidies or trade protection, and that was not good. And I think as a result of that, uh, industrial strategy got a very, very bad name in the UK and, and elsewhere. Uh, I, I think it, 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 it came back um, more recently, I mean, partly as a recognition that um, there are some very serious market failures, in, particularly in some sector of the economy, um, areas around innovation, training, uh, the need to look long term, and the fact that government, you know, even if you don't have an industrial strategy, the government is making choices between one firm and another, one sector and another, through things like government procurement. And when we got into the coalition, and one of the episodes which I think changed our view was there was a, a rail contract for um, Thameslink, which was won by Siemens, and probably and almost certainly the right decision on the merits of the case. But it was very clear that nobody had actually sat down with the British producers, which were included Bombardier and Derby, and actually talk to them about long-term procurement for railway carriages and, and the rest. So there was complete absence of connected thinking. Uh, and that was one of the things that prompted our 
approach to more active intervention. Uh, we then became, uh, you know, we decided on a sectoral approach in addition to the, the kind of standard stuff you do around promoting research and training. And um, the, the industrial strategy that I oversaw, we had about, you know, 11, 12 sectors and they weren't rigid. You know, some industries expressed an interest in working together long term. A good example was, was railways, actually, in the railway supply sector. Uh, others uh, announced themselves wings and wheels, um, and particularly in the car industry, there was a, an interest in collective research that would not have happened otherwise in new propulsion systems for engines. Um, again, the Treasury put a bit of funding into that, and it's happened. And similarly, the aerospace industry that was drifting offshore because of lack of government support for their R&D. Uh, again, there was a 50-50 collaborative project with, um, with the private sector. And uh, not just manufacturing, I think one of our big success stories actually was creative industries, where when you actually brought these guys together for you know, design, architecture, software development, you realized that although they were quite different, they had some common problems, um, lack of any standards for training for apprenticeship schemes, the fact that they were all trading on intellectual property rather than real property so they couldn't get bank credit. So there was need for some mechanism to deal with this. And so there was a real value in having a kind of sectoral approach, providing it was um, subtle and flexible and not prescriptive. And I think that's the model that you know, it works. And I would very much encourage the new government to take on what we did. Well, look, we're in danger of agreeing with, it, uh, with each other, which is, you know, maybe good, but it doesn't make for a good um, audience participation. Um, I just, I just query the premise behind your question. The idea that if you, you know, we leave Europe, and you know, we pull up the shutters, uh, you know, we uh, almost create a siege economy, and that'll force us to become more inventive, and you know, our industry is better, and trading, and so on. I think that's complete rubbish. I'm sure that was exactly the idea I was proposing. I wasn't suggesting sure, sure you were, but I, I know that there are some of the Brexiteers who say, if there's, you know, you're basically we're being stopped from doing everything by Europe, but don't worry, now that we're out of it, we can trade with the people all over the world, all sorts of things become possible. I was going to, a couple of examples of things that we are good at, uh, where government has helped, uh, but where, frankly, the ability to trade with Europe is rather important. The most striking one is the one that Vince touched on. And if you take aviation, we are very good at the technology that builds and designs wings of aeroplanes, uh, the equipment that uh, you know, keeps them flying, and engines, of course. And Airbus is an example of where there is a joint venture between ourselves, the French, the Germans, and the Spanish to a certain extent. And there's an excellent example of where government has actually provided loan funding as well as direct grants. The loan funding, by the way, is paid back. The government's you know, got more than its money back. Um, and you know, next time you fly on an Airbus, most of what keeps it in the sky is made in this country. It's finished off in France and often badged as a French aircraft, but it isn't. It's, 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 it's largely made here. But the, you, know, you have to ask yourself, if we leave you know, the European Union, and we don't have anything in its place, you know, in participation in the single market and the customs union. So much of that aircraft is made a bit here, a bit in France, a bit in Germany, with the bits coming backwards and forwards during the, the, the actual manufacture of, of the, of the aeroplane. Um, you have to ask yourself, you know, is that going to be possible in the future? And if you want to train people and excite, you know, uh, uh, people at school to learn the right skills and then go to university and so on, you've got to be able to point at things we make and we make well to get them into those industries, which is why I think, you know, and you know, we've all alluded to this and, you know, the, the three of us agree on this, you can't ignore the fact that this country has taken a decision a few months ago that could have very profound implications on our ability to grow, our ability to uh, provide you know, the sort of uh, jobs to, uh, to, to, to get the right incentives to training and so on. The same in car manufacturing. We make more cars and lorries uh, now in this country than we did in the 1970s, which used to be seen as the heyday of, of all this. Again, a lot of what we make is sold into Europe, I and mean, that's why Nissan was so keen uh, to... Um, 
to get an understanding from the British government that we would have access to the single market and presumably a customs union. Yes. Um, all I'd like to know is um, if, if that is really is Her Majesty's government, that we should be part a member of the single market and also a member of the customs union, I'm say three cheers for that, but just tell us that's your policy uh, rather than say, well, it's all in a private letter which we can't actually see. Uh, so, you know, I think that the membership of the European Union is profoundly, it is going to be so profound and so important for anything, frankly, this Commission does. I think this, I think this whole conversation shows how hard it is to be engaging with these issues now without begging all of these previous debates and c continued concerns around the direction that's taken um, with leaving the EU. Um, I want to push back a little bit on, on one thing before going to the audience, because I'm looking at this audience, especially the first few rows are just full of people I know who could write their own commissions on the back of an envelope. The back rows are good as well. <laughs> <laughs> but they're the ones I can see. Cause You've I obviously never had to get yourself elected. I can't see, with the lights, I can't see all these other people. But the, um, they're experts in I the first three rows. I can't see very far. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it is possible, without painting some vision uh, that all of us would say is unrealistic yeah. about a siege Britain where we suddenly do all the things and we suddenly discover that all these barriers were not barriers and that you don't need trade and you don't need openness. Clearly, that's not going to happen. But we, if we are where we are and we're trying to take some positives from where we are, um, surely this decision could at least in some areas force or embolden politicians to push in areas that they would have wanted to push in before but maybe weren't able to. And I would highlight one, partly because I'm chairing a commission on inclusive growth, working with cities um, to uh, continue with the vision that you had of the Northern Powerhouse in a more sort of general way around inclusion. Could it force us to think just as much about the quality of growth as the quantity of growth? And Alistair mentioned this in talking. I mean, mm. I've certainly found as we go around doing evidence sessions in Sheffield, we had an evidence sef session in Sheffield five days after the Brexit vote. Um, there are parts of the country which on paper have done pretty well in addressing some of the key challenges that they had in terms of employment and even growth. Um, they have much higher employment levels than they did when they were known as black spots of you know, post-industrial uh, Britain. And yet they still have pretty much the same social problems that we thought would be fixed by having the rise in employment because the kind of employment there's been has not brought those social benefits that we thought would come with it. Sometimes it has. I mean, there have been improving situation. But I think there has, across the country, been a move to think more about the quality of growth and the kind of economic model we have in these cities, which, as I say, Al Alistair mentioned, you know, is this an opportunity to focus on that? And if it is, to some extent, you know, where would you focus I want to briefly each of you, and then we'll also then we'll go to the. Well, questions. I think I'm not sure it's you know um, connected with the, the membership of the European Union, um, but there's no doubt that if you look at my um, adult lifetime, there's been a transformation in our city centres. You know, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, uh, you know these cities have seen an incredible renaissance. They were hollowed out. They were declining populations. Uh, and now they are, in, I think, universally vibrant uh, and exciting places. It's a remarkable fact about London that it's only this year, I think, that its population has exceeded the population it had in 1939. Uh, so it, it, you know, that is, there is a city that lost people to the suburbs, and, and now people live in the city centre again. Uh, and, but I think it is fair to say that outside of the city centres, in these sort of suburban centres of some of these industrial towns, in the county towns, the, the kind of suburban, the, the towns on the periphery of cities in West Yorkshire, in Lancashire, and so on. Uh, they have not felt that regeneration, and they haven't seen that progress over the last 30 or 40 years. And the people and who it's quite did live in those centres well, have also not necessarily Well, it's felt. interesting if you want to look at yeah. the mapping of the Brexit vote. Actually, the city centres largely voted to remain in the EU, and the the heavy votes against EU membership were found in those kind of, I don't know, you know market towns or county towns of, uh, of in, uh, or industrial towns is probably a better description of them, um, uh, around the country. And in a way, it's more difficult for top-down regeneration policy. You know, it's, it's, it's relatively easy for a chancellor to write a cheque, you know, for the 
for the regeneration of the Liverpool docks or whatever. But it's it's slightly more difficult to get to the to the old mill towns of Lancashire or the the, the wool towns of West Yorkshire. So, uh, you know, I think that's an area that I have not really seen compelling work on. It's something your your commission could do and and, and the LSE could do. I think the other point I'd just make is. There are going to, you know, the, the LSE work will come out at a very opportune time because these issues about our trading relationship with the EU and the single market, the customs union, all the things that Alice is talking about are going to be very live next year. Uh, and remember, there are also going to have to be uh, po um, stru policy structures that we have taken for granted that we are going to have to invent and create for our own country. I'll give you one very good example. You know, chances of the Exchequer can hide behind the EU state aid regime. So what happens is firm, you know, is in trouble in often politically sensitive part of the country, and uh, there's a lot of political pressure to do something about the firm, even if you don't think it's got a particularly great future, and even if actually maybe, you know, more jobs would be created if uh, resources were devoted elsewhere. And the state aid regime is pretty effective. Now, you know, my, my successors in the Treasury would like to have, I suspect, a state aid regime for the UK that will protect the Exchequer, which, by the way, means protecting you, the taxpayers, from these, you know, company-driven decisions to bail out uh, through subsidy or through particular trade protection individual um, uh, companies. And, you know, the LSE, the, I, you know, I bet in the Treasury and the, the new biz department, they are thinking about what that regime might be. I suspect they want to put it as far away from politicians as possible and give it some kind of legal um, status, like uh, the competition regime. Their work from the LSE, I suspect, would be extremely fruitful because there will certainly not be anything on the shelf that can be taken off and dusted down um, in, the, uh, in, in Whitehall at the moment. Alistair. How can we focus on the, on the quality of growth and respond to some of those concerns? Well, I, I was just thinking as George was speaking that, you know, we're moving towards a model outside London, basically, where we are looking at, and we're really talking about England here, because again, the situation in Scotland, which I'm happy to talk about, but it, it, it's different for a number of reasons. But uh, looking at look, the big cities like Manchester and Newcastle and Leeds, as the sort of economic hub, if you like. And, of course, lots of people, you know, living in the towns and uh, around that will benefit one way or another, but a lot of them won't uh, because, you know, there isn't anything in, you know, some of the smaller towns and so on. And also what they see is their high streets get stripped out so you've got nothing left except for Greggs or something and second-hand shops. And, you know, people say, well, it's not like it used to be. And you know they don't feel that part of that. So I think you know it's one. I don't have an I don't have an, an answer to it. And that you know maybe that's something that the, this particular group can look at. How do you ensure uh, that you've got growth in different parts of the country and it isn't just concentrated in a few places? It can be done. Greater Manchester is a case in point where you've got local authorities in Greater Manchester do work very closely together. Um, uh, you have got a world class university. You've got many financial institutions. You've got a critical mass there. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a sort of model you can build on. Uh, there's one other thing I'd just add you know, into the mix here, which we haven't talked about, but to my mind is critical for growth, and this applies to the whole country, and that is, you know, you know really all th governments in which we've all served have talked about the need to get more housing, and we've talked about it, but there hasn't actually been too much in the way of delivery of housing. The housing and the quality of housing in many of the areas we're talking about is absolutely critical, but it's also critical in London as well. You know, I was talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the millennial generation. My generation, and my guess is, you know, you two as well, it was almost automatic. You would buy a house in your, 19, in your, in your 20s. Uh, though now people are struggling to rent, trying to get a house on their own. I speak here with some feeling on the subject. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think it is a huge problem in London, which is such a major influence on our whole, uh, the whole UK economy. If we do not start providing housing, uh, then that will have just as serious a consequence as some of the other things we've been talking about tonight. So housing needs to be added to the mix. Uh, on cities, I mean, there, there is some quite interesting research which suggests that in most European countries, 
Cities grow faster than the national economy. They lead growth. And in the UK, the opposite is true, uh, with the single exception of London, and I think, no, I think Bristol also. Um, and one has to ask why British cities perform so badly economically and are a drag. And uh, there are no doubt many reasons, but, but one of them is that all decision-making and you know, the self-respect that goes with that has been hollowed out of city government, and that has now begun to change, you know, led by Manchester, but elsewhere, you now begin to get cities acquiring some degree of autonomy uh, and making decentralized choices, and that's terribly important. I, I started my political life somewhat improbably uh, as a Labour councillor in Glasgow, and, you know, and it wasn't exactly a great model of governance. You know, I think four of my colleagues disappeared to Barlini prison when I was on the council. <laughs> these, these things happened, but, but, we, but we did things, you know, sort of houses got built. I mean, not all of them were great, some of them had to be pulled down again, but, they, they, but there was real That's kind of urban activism and, um, you know, dynamic government. And I think we, be, I think we have recognized that. It, it's also, of course, connected with uh, the revenue. I mean, I think compared with Malta, we're the only country in Europe that doesn't allow local government to raise its own funds on any, of any magnitude. And so I think we've begun the process of decentralization. It's got to go further in terms of revenue raising, borrowing, and the rest. And then you may begin to get a writ of real urban entrepreneurial activity. And I suspect just continuing a little bit in the tradition of the first uh, commission, uh, some of the issues around the treatment of investment and whether or not one should make it possible for uh, local governments to borrow f for housing yeah, because that's yeah. actually an asset that's going to potentially appreciate and have that be treated in a different way in the public accounts. I think that some of those issues actually it could contribute to. Right, we've got the uh, minimum amount, which would be 15 minutes for uh, questions. And I guess short, I don't know if we've made a ban on comments, but if they are comments, they have to be very short. Um, and the questions have to be genuine questions. Uh, I'll take a, a few, gosh, lots of hands going up. Um, here, and then actually this was the hand that went up first, the man in the white shirt, up, further up. Hi, Do Laura you. Hughes from The Telegraph. Can I ask if you think Theresa May was right to criticise some of the policies of the Bank of England, and do you sympathise with Mark Carney's frustration? In the context of the LSE Growth uh, Commission. <laughs> I will uh, leave it. I've, I've got a very, very capable successor as Chancellor who I have uh, massive confidence in. Well, uh, I'm not from a national newspaper. I'm a graduate, I'm a postgraduate student here at LSE. Um, and I, I suppose I have a question for George Osborne. 2015 had the largest sell-off of public assets since Thatcher spurred on through Eurostar, Royal Mail, Royal Bank of Scotland, the shares sale in Lloyd's as well. To that end, and I stress that <laughs> this is a genuine question and not merely just a political one, is the sell-off of family silver through privatisation a realistic strategy towards long-term economic growth, or as some might say, merely a form of short-termism? Well, I don't think the government should own those assets. There are lots of assets the government should own, you know, schools, hospitals, and so on, but I, I don't think the government should um, uh, own Eurostar, and I don't think the government, you know, should be a long-term owner of the Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm sure Alistair, who made that particular investment, would agree with me. Um, <laughs> did you, did you? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, is, you know, you, if you, it's... Did you think it was a long-term growth strategy when you did it? I well, I get that impression uh, of what the when you the, the sell-offs it weren't actually that. No, no, I thought very much so. Look, I think um, you know, um, to, to, without going into all the, the the different cases in the case of Royal Mail, actually the last Labour government and the coalition government wanted to get the Royal Mail into the private sector. You know, the reason why you have DHL and all these delivery companies, they are actually privatised European mail companies. They were the Dutch or German post offices that were privatized. And then we were surprised that they were more efficient and better at delivering parcels and you know, d d delivered it when you said you were going to be in and all of that kind of thing. 
And I think, um, I think there's a, a, a huge opportunity for the Royal Mail in the private sector to raise the capital, because frankly, Chancellor's Exchequer, whoever they are, Labour, Conservative, Liberal, Democrat, they are not going to prioritise money into the Royal Mail over money into the National Health Service. And that was why you know, that industry didn't get the investment that, the, that in the private sector it might have got. Um, when it came to the banks, very briefly, you know, and I, Alistair absolutely should speak on the subject because he was, he was there at the, uh, the coalface. But, you know, it was never our plan to have a long-term ownership of large retail banks. And if anything, the longer that goes on, the more, it, you know, corrosive it becomes of the competitiveness of those banks and their ability to lend money to the small businesses in our economy. Did, you know, Vince, uh, when he was at the business department, you know, did work exposing some of the th problems that the Royal Bank of Scotland had with its lending practices. And actually, I think it's been a good thing that we've been able to largely get out of Lloyds Bank, and I hope we can complete that job in, with this new government. I think RBS is going to take longer. But again, that, I would say that is industrial strategy or economic policy, however you want to describe it. And it's not uh, setting off the family silver, as you described it. Right. I know can we I, can do I, have can I just yeah, just yeah. A, a brief, brief yeah. point. I, mean, I don't think I would use the word investment when we put money into um, <laughs> <coughs> RBS. Um, you know, and on, you know, on the 8th of October in 2008, we were faced with RBS having to close its doors maybe in two or three hours. So we had to put money into it, but it was never the intention to keep owning it. Now, as George has said, it will take some time yet, some years, before we get our money back on RBS because it was in such a mess. Lloyd's wasn't quite so damaged, but it's quite right the government should get out of it. So I don't, I don't see that the government needs to own those banks. If the government wants to own a business bank, you know, one that lends money to help firms, start-up firms grow a bit longer, which lots of countries do, that's an entirely different proposition. But it's not setting us up, up as a high street bank. And I think the general point that I would make is that I th what, where government needs to spend its money, and it's always going to be limited, is on things that where either the private sector won't or where it's inappropriate like in my view the health service or you know if it comes to the railway network and in, in, in every country in the world the private sector can't work railways it doesn't work it I mean I, I think frankly franchising may have had its day in this uh, and I speak as someone who's in charge of transport for four years but building railways is something the private sector does not do equally in, Moot point is whether we should, who should be building nuclear power stations. We should concentrate on those things that can make a difference that government can best do, but we shouldn't hold on to shares and things where, frankly, you know, um, there's no need to be there. And frankly, you know, we didn't want to be there in the first place in relation to the banks. Just say, so I had a slightly checkered history here, having privatised the Royal Mail but introduced two new state owned banks, uh, one of which the government is now trying to sell. Um, and, of course, I think very few people are aware of this, particularly when they hear Jeremy Corbyn going on saying we must nationalise the railways, that the coalition nationalised the railways by accident. And, I know even George is aware of this, but we, there, was a <laughs> <laughs> there was a statistical reclassification by the government statisticians, which has declared that That's network right. rail... That was a bad day at the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a nationalised industry. I mean, I, I mean, the simple point is it's horses for courses. There's just one point about RBS, because I think Alistair struggled with this, and we did in the coalition government, and it is a, a kind of drifting hulk. I mean, in a sensible wor world, you know, we'd have broken it up and created mm -hmm. specialist banks or competing banks, but one of the things that only became apparent quite late on was that the IT systems of these banks, particularly RBS, are just so appalling that you just can't do anything with them. You can't fragment, break them up as any rational business would do. Right, I'm going to take questions together and I'm sort of conscious I'm not going to not take the journalist questions but I don't want it to be only journalist uh, questions. All right, so one journalist question here but I'm going to take them a few together. Uh, hello, uh, Carol Walker from the BBC. Um, I wanted to ask uh, George Osborne whether he thinks that his successor is right to abandon targets and have a much more flexible approach to getting the deficit down in order to boost growth and whether he should have the scope to inject a lot more money into the economy if necessary, given the uncertainties post the Brexit vote. OK, so a broad question about fiscal policy. Yeah, there. Um, my question is just about how important do you think it is to the UK's growth in protecting the uh, financial services industry, um, you know, through maintaining passporting rights in the EU? Uh, 
that's a good one. Right at the back. Yeah, the sort of Um, my name is Ali Nekpe. I'm in a, a working group with John Vickers and, uh, and others on competition policy. So my question is this. Should there be any significant changes uh, to competition policy post-Brexit? Okay, and a final one from somewhere else in the room. Let me write the back. With the excellent hat. Hi. Um, yeah, it kind of links on from lady said over there um this is to george um what fate do you see for your charter for fiscal responsibility um especially now kind of philip hammond has hinted at kind of looser fiscal policy and abandoning the surplus target for 2020 i suspect the word ab abandon will never be used formally uh, we don't really know anything about what he said so far we just have uh, stories but um let's those are three quite meaty areas that are actually relevant to the, the Commission. Uh, fiscal policy to be construed either politically or not politically. Um, financial services, which we haven't talked about very much. And actually, I think, I think the competition policy is another element that was quite strong in the first Commission and I'm sure is ripe for more thinking. Vincent, do you want to...? Well, I think the big question on, co on competition policy is do we now change our approach to takeovers? It's an issue that Theresa May has raised. Um, at the moment, it's very, very highly restrictive, partly because of the 2003 Enterprise Act, which limits uh, in government intervention to cases of national security, I think financial services and newspapers. Um, and the European mergers directive is another constraint on government intervention. But, I mean, I took the view, particularly when we had the problems around Pfizer, that there are certain categories of companies that I think probably there is a justification for intervention um, in the public interest, particularly where you have large concentrations of science, which has been publicly financed, and I would extend... I think the takeover um, restrictions is freedom uh, once we leave the European Union. That's something we, we could do. Just a brief word on macroeconomic policy. I, this is for George and Alistair more. But um, I, I mean, you, you asked a question about flexibility. I mean, the simple truth is in the coalition, despite all the kind of hostile rhetoric, we were actually very flexible. I mean, the ob objective at the beginning was to deal with the structural current deficit in four years, five and we finished up following the Darling plan. We didn't put it quite like that, but <laughs> that's essentially what we did. Uh, as, and clearly, you've got to respond to circumstances, and there's now a major um, economic shock, and it would be totally right for um, Hammond to respond in a flexible way. Well, look, on, on the competition policy, um, I agree with Vince that you know, it need, would need looked at anyway. I just think you have to be careful that you don't sort of lapse into a sort of French-style um, competition policy where you start designating more and more companies as being in the national interest. I think yogurt is in France, you know, where you effectively stop anybody else coming in. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a legitimate point. Look what happened to Cadbury's, for example, uh, you know, where all sorts of promises were made and abandoned and, you know, Cadbury's went with it. Um, on fiscal policy, uh, you know, I just think you know, there's two things I'd say. One is you have to be realistic. Uh, Vince was, you know, mentioned my plan. Uh, it's, I suppose ancient history now. In the 2010, I thought we should aim to halve the deficit in a five-year period, and I was absolutely delighted when the coalition government managed to deliver that at the end of five years, <laughs> despite the fact that they You're thought welcome. they thought that it was such a <laughs> terrible policy at the time, um, <clears throat> uh, which just shows. Um, I, 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 I think, you know, I, I think. You know, Philip Hammond is right to be flexible. I don't think there was ever any chance of us breaking even in four years' time. But with a shock to the system like we've had just now, to attempt to meet that target just now, I think would be uh, foolish. I also think we've got the headroom in this country because basically people, you know, people are, are, have confidence in our, um, our our ability to repay our debts, even though it may take longer than was originally thought. We have the headroom that we need to spend on some of the infrastructure projects we were talking about earlier. And you know, when you've got a major shock to the system, <clears throat> whether it was the banking collapse in 2008 or Brexit, 
and you know, by the way, I think you know we are in something of a phony <coughs> war at the moment. Uh, you know, people. You know, when, when you have a shock to the system, it sometimes takes two or three years before you see the consequences of that decision showing up in terms of economic um, uh, consequences. Uh, so no one be, should be surprised that it looks like not not much has happened in the last four months. Uh, but the shock to the system cannot be un, um, um, overestimated. And I think uh, Philip Hammond is absolutely right uh, when he says that he needs the flexibility to be able to respond to that. And I hope that he will ignore the comment of some of his close colleagues in the cabinet on the Brexit side who are saying, no, you shouldn't do that, because that would show that actually some of the fears did have some uh, uh, strength behind them. Uh, I think he's absolutely right to be flexible. And you know, all chancellors need to be mindful of the public finances, but they also need to be mindful of the fact that fiscal policy is necessary, because you can't sort this out simply by relying on monetary policy alone. And uh, you know, I'm, 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 since the day the Telegraph asked the question, I you think George's appointment to Mark Carney was absolutely right. I would have made the same appointment myself. I'd still been Chancellor then. And I think some of the criticism are frankly disgraceful. You, it's a free country. You can criticise um, uh, people, but you shouldn't sort of almost run a systematic campaign to try and get rid of somebody. Uh, especially with an independent central bank. But monetary policy cannot do all this on its own. Uh, you need fiscal policy, and therefore you need flexibility. Well, I mean, even in the um, two weeks that I was the Chancellor after the Brexit vote, uh, I actually <laughs> said <laughs> that um, it was unlikely we would be able to achieve a surplus by the end of the decade. So, uh, you know, the Brexit vote, because of the impact on the economy, is likely to lead to more borrowing. And I said as Chancellor that we shouldn't uh, chase that target. And, you know, I, again, trust in the judgment of our very capable and able new Chancellor, Philip Hammond. Um, on, the other, on the other issues, um, the finance, it, it's a huge employer in this country, not just in this city, it's the, it's the largest employer in the next 10 largest cities in Britain. You know, that is how big the financial services sector is. It is not all derivatives traders earning millions of pounds in the city of London. It is you know, a massive industry. In, Edinburgh, and Manchester, and Birmingham, and Cardiff, and so on, Bournemouth. Uh, and Bournemouth, where J.P. Morgan have a very large uh, centre. You should <laughs> declare your interest. Um, but um, you know, it's a really important industry. And by the way, finance is, you know, enabling people to buy homes and financing the small business and providing a pension for someone in retirement. That's what that's financial services, uh, as well as the you know the city markets. So uh, it, you know, it's going to be a very important industry. Uh, in the Brexit negotiations because uh, Britain has had access, British financial services or companies based here have had access to uh, European markets. Uh, and then finally on competition, you know, again, this is, you know, we have, we've had our own competition authorities, but we've relied on EU state aid, uh, EU competition regime as well. It's something we're going to have to devise. Here I side more with uh, Alistair than Vince and his warnings. And I'll just give you one practical example. In my constituency, I had a very large AstraZeneca site that employed 5,000 people. And as chancellor, I, w I was in number 11 when I got the call from AstraZeneca saying they were essentially pulling out of the site. And it was a, not only a, you know, terrible for my constituency, uh, also it felt on the day, but also a big national news story. There are now more people employed on that site uh, three years later because of all the small biotech firms that have been set up with a bit of government help and an enterprise zone and so on. But there is now an incredible diverse economic system there instead of one big employer. And, you know, if, if I had had my, you know, any chance in the, in the position without state aid restrictions, without a competition regime, we've been so tempted to throw money at trying to keep AstraZeneca on the site. But actually, with three or four years the hindsight, that wouldn't necessarily have been the right decision. And you just, you know, don't assume to, don't assume that, you know, government in any country is all knowing about future economic developments. You're always clear about what you're losing. It's so difficult to predict what you're gaining. Can I just very quickly on the city, uh, because we haven't talked about it very much, but my, you are known as someone who ha did have a good relationship with the city and can talk to the broader benefits of financial services as you just have, but also for being very politically shrewd. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, 
Immediately after the vote and since then, my impression is that anyone with sort of poli no politician at the moment thinks there is anything to be gained from saying any of the positive things about financial services that you just said in the wake of this vote. And I think the fear of people in the city and more generally is that that will continue to be the case and could lead to quite a bad outcome. Do you think, is that true? Are, or do you uh, think from, from, uh, from memory, there are over a million fellow citizens who are employed in the financial services industry. But and they, you... you know, they and their families and the businesses that service the companies they work for you know, depend on that industry being successful. And it is not, uh, you know, the small number of multi-millionaire traders in the city of London. These are incredibly important employers, not just big And you're calling investment now banks, in government. Are you telling that you're well, saying that it's I think they're more than, sensible I think for they're, them to they're say they're very that? aware of that. And both uh, Theresa May and Philip Hammond you know, have made a point in New York of, uh, of going to that city and, and, and stressing the, you know, how uh, Britain is open for financial business. So, yes, I agree, of course, there have been huge mistakes in financial services over the years that Alistair had to deal with and I had to deal with and Vince has had to deal with. But let's not, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is a massively important industry for the UK, provides, by the way, those quality jobs in many cases that you were talking about earlier. And we would be absolutely crazy to send that business offshore. I think, Stephanie, it's, 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 you're right that in, instinctively politicians say, you, you know, are reluctant to get into an area where you know, it's been very you know, popular to, in, to, you know, cr to criticise it. But you know, I live in Edinburgh, and Edinburgh is the fourth biggest financial centre in Europe. Or put it another way, if you took the financial services centre out of Edinburgh, it would cripple it. Um, and, you know, as, as George said, there are cities and towns throughout the country that depend on this. Ten percent of the workforce in the country work for the financial services industry. It is just as important as the car industry, and which is why, you know, I, since we're obviously being told the time's up and it's closing time, um, that, uh, you know, I'm very pleased what the, the government has apparently promised to Nissan. I would just dearly like to know where the government stands on everything else. If, you know, it's four months since we left, and I haven't heard the Prime Minister say a single word on arguably the biggest set of decisions we're going to have to make since the Second World War. So, you never know. Right. George Osborne started this whole uh, evening by saying we shouldn't forget, and the Commission shouldn't forget or ignore the elephant in the room, which is Brexit. I think on the basis of this, there's absolutely no danger of us forgetting. I think there is a danger of us being trapped underneath that big elephant. And maybe one of the things the Commission could do is start to try and drag us out from underneath the Brexit elephant. But uh, thank you very much for all hey, Thank you. Now, it, it's my job to do thank, the thank yous, but you've just shown your expression of thanks in a very strong and uh, clear way. Uh, the one word we didn't pick up from the blackboard, from the whiteboard, the screen, was uh, sustainability, although Vince did mention the green investment. Because we couldn't see it, it was behind us. <laughs> <laughs> but Vince did mention the green investment bank, Richard, and the transparency, I was involved in that too. Uh, and it was a, a great success, and I hope, I hope it continues that way. But what we've uh, seen tonight is enormously useful to the work of the Growth Commission. It couldn't have been kicked off in a better way, full, up, full of ideas. Secondly, um, we've been reminded that in the recent past, I'm not commenting anything about the current group of politicians, but in the recent past, we've had politicians who have been reflective, thoughtful, and analytical, and we wish them a long life. Um, in <laughs> In the, uh, in the recent past, again not commenting on current, we've also had um, a BBC economics editor who's been ref reflective, thoughtful and analytical as well. And thank you very much, uh, Steph, for your uh, enormous uh, thoughtfulness and energy and insight in uh, leading this conversation. Um, the, uh, and lastly, it, it's actually been very enjoyable. And I think I showed... You showed signs of enjoying yourself as, uh, as well. So it's been a wonderful start to, uh, or wonderful launch for the Growth Commission. We're enormously grateful to you, all of you, um, Steph and, and George and Alistair and Vince, for contributing in such a strong and uh, constructive, creative way. Thank you very much. <laughs>